So again, welcome everybody. Welcome to this virtual space. We're really excited to have you here today. If you were with us on our last culinary training on Zoom, welcome back. And um, if you didn't catch that one and this is your first one, we wanna say, hey, welcome. And we're excited to have all new attendees and returning. My name is Jessica Vicinski. I'm a child nutrition specialist with ODE. You may have seen me uh, out in your schools, child cares, or organizations. Um, you may have seen me at events or doing trainings. I have the amazing opportunity to be able to do trainings for the organization and the department on a variety of topics. But I have to say that my absolute favorite topic is culinary, and that's what we're doing today. So I get pretty excited when we get one of these coming up. Um, so I'm glad you're here to be with us. I also wanna introduce my counterpart, Krista, who came on a little bit earlier. Earlier, Krista Hawkins is with the Oregon Dairy and Nutrition Council, or ODNC. Um, she is running our Zoom webinar today. Uh, so thanks to Krista for doing that. ODE and ODNC have been working for over 10 years on culinary trainings throughout the state. And we're just gonna keep going. We're just gonna keep doing them uh, because we like them so much and we've heard so much positive feedback from all of our sponsors uh, about the trainings. And so of course this year we're doing them virtually, but we hope to uh, be in person again sometime soon, maybe do a hybrid of virtual and in person. We'll see, we'll see where all of this takes us. I also wanna introduce uh, Jenny Kolpak and Chris Davison. They are both former NSLP sponsors, so they know your pain. Hopefully you don't have a lot, and neither did they, but they are now on our school nutrition team here at ODE. Um, they're specialists, and they've been helping behind the scenes to gather all the information that we're gonna provide during this session and that we included in the participant handbook. We've got some really fun kind of poll activities throughout the session that they'll be handling. Um, they'll also be talking with you in the chat. So again, if you have comments or questions or thoughts, go ahead and type them in. We want this to be a conversation. So thanks to both of them. We have a, a couple other guests that we'll introduce a little bit later. So I'll uh, you know raise the tension a little bit, get you excited about it. But to give you a bit of background before we get started, we had our first virtual culinary training and after that we sent out an evaluation. We asked you what you thought went well, what maybe could be improved, any thoughts that you might have, and we got a great response. We had some fantastic answers come through. What you told us and what we heard was that you really missed an opportunity that we usually have in culinary trainings to connect, to connect with one another, to share ideas, to share stories, um, to just chat with one another and, in a comfortable and fun environment. And so we definitely heard you. So I want you all to put on your chatty hat because we've saved some time, about 15 minutes or so at the end of the uh, session. And during that time, we're just gonna open it up for questions, conversation, ideas, thoughts. So we hope this will be great options for connection. We are also gonna flip the script a little bit, as the cool kids say, and we are going to um, have you hear from some of your fellow sponsors, what they're doing in their kitchen. So you don't just have to stare at this talking head, you get to hear from sponsors out there in the field what they're doing um, with our, our theme, what sort of things they're doing in their kitchen. So let's talk about our theme a little bit. After that first training, our team got together and we were talking about topics and we really felt like, all right, it's time. We need to talk about vegetables. Vegetables poor little vegetables. They're the underdog of components, aren't they? You know, getting younger and even sometimes the older participants to either select 
um, or you know, choose the vegetables to even eat them, sometimes can be hard. We've got those that definitely do it, but sometimes it can be a bit of a struggle. The grain and the meat need alternate component. They're usually bundled together in some fabulous, delicious entree. You've got the fruit that has that natural sweetness that everybody loves. Then you've got the milk, which is great to wash it all down. Krista, especially if it's chocolate milk, our all-time favorite. But that poor little vegetable, he gets you know, stuck in the background. He's that underdog. And what we want to do with our theme today is we want to elevate the underdog. We're going to take that sub-zero and we're going to make it a superhero. And I did just coin that, copyright it, put it on TikTok. <laughs> We're making it a sensation. We're going to do some superhero vegetables today. We're going to vary our vegetables. So of course, once we decided our theme, we had to send out another survey because we love those surveys. And we asked all of our sponsors, what are the hardest vegetables to get participants to eat? What are the easiest ones? What do you have the best time with? And then what sort of tips or tricks or things do you have that you use? And what do you want to know? So again, awesome response. Thank you all. If you uh, submitted a survey, it really helped us to develop this. Many of you mentioned that you like to mix things up. So you present a variety of colors, a variety of shapes, different textures, and I absolutely agree. It's a great way to entice people, to really um, entice their eyes, not just their taste buds. You know, you really kind of got to reel them in with what they see before you catch them with what they taste. So great ideas there. You also talked about using different cooking methods, um, roasting or steaming to bring out the flavors of the vegetables to really enhance them. And then some of you discussed using different herbs and spices with your vegetable dishes, maybe um, pairing them with a dipping sauce or something fun and tasty. And we're gonna talk about all of those things today. We have a packed agenda, <laughs> if you didn't recognize it by the participant handbook that we sent out. I do wanna talk a little bit about that. Um, all of you should have received an email with a participant handbook. Most of you received it on Tuesday. Some maybe received it um, uh, today if you signed up later. Um, it has a ton of information in it. And please do not think that you have to print this out. Do not think that you need to follow along with us. It's really a resource for you. It has um, a, several recipes some of which we're gonna talk about today, some of which we just wanna offer up. Um, it's got cooking methods, um, information on cooking times, information on herbs and spices, lots of information, um, maybe information overload, but I think it will really help as you go back to your kitchen to think about how you can vary your vegetables, how you can bring that sub-zero to a superhero. So that is our packet for today. Before we move into the first demonstration of a recipe, I want to send it over to Jenny and I'm going to have her launch our first poll and I'll get myself set up. Great. Thank you, Jessica. So our first poll is an opinion poll and we want to hear from you on what vegetable subgroup is the most challenging to offer in your program? Is it dark green, red orange, legumes, starchy, or the other vegetable group? And we have about 20 seconds left in the poll before I close it. So everyone go ahead and pick which one is the most ch challenging to offer in your program. Mm, that's a tough one. What's the most challenging? Okay, and the dark answer green. is dark green. Followed by legumes. Uh, we don't see that anyone has any particular challenges with offering red, orange, starchy, or other vegetables. Who doesn't love a good potato? <laughs> 
Yeah, that's actually pretty surprising. I thought that legumes would be top of the list, but dark green. Aha. So you guys were reading our minds because when I thought about um, our first veggie recipe, what some of y'all said in the survey was, you know, you're just bored of the same old vegetables or maybe bored of serving vegetables the same old way. And you were looking for some different ways to do things. So I thought about, okay, well, what do I like to do when I'm looking for something to serve? And I like to go out and look for a recipe that maybe I find you know, semi-interesting and then rearrange it a little bit, add a little pizzazz, add a little sparkle and then make it super interesting. So that's what I decided to do for our first recipe. And I know what y'all are gonna say. You're gonna say, Jessica, we work in child nutrition and you and all of the other specialists have drilled it into our heads that we should not change a recipe because it will change the crediting and it will be you know, uncreditable. And okay, that is true to a point. But I'm going to show you some changes that you can make, some little things, some tweaks that are not going to change the crediting. All right. And so I went out and I looked for some recipes and I found a broccoli bite recipe. It's a USDA recipe. And I'm kind of showing it on this lovely little phone camera I have and I'll show it right here. It's a perfectly fine recipe. However, when I was looking at it, I was thinking, you know, if anything, the past two years has taught us is that portable grab and go recipes might be important. And this recipe, one serving for the broccoli bite is a two thirds cup broccoli bite, which that's kind of a big bite, especially if you've got little mouths and little hands. So what I'm gonna do is I took this recipe and I rearranged it a little bit and we're gonna make it a superhero. Not that it was sub-zero, I'm not saying that, but we are gonna make it a superhero. So I had to rearrange the name of the recipe as well because that's what I do. So we're going to make Rocco Poppers. That's right, you heard it here, Rocco Poppers. The recipe is in your handbook. We have um, servings of 12, 25, 50, and 100, I believe. Um, so feel free to check that out later on. I didn't change any of the ingredients from the broccoli bites to the broccoli poppers. I just sort of rearranged things a little bit. I did add one ingredient that they didn't have on the USDA recipe, and that was just a little bit of flour to give it just a little bit more structure as a popper. So we're going to get started. I have a big bowl, very big bowl, and to that bowl, I am going to add some breadcrumbs. These are just everyday dried breadcrumbs. I'm going to add some frozen egg product, some cheese, and then that flour I talked about. Okay, and I'm just gonna sprinkle that on there. Hopefully everybody can see that, all right. And then I'm gonna stir this around. And what you wanna do, you really wanna make sure that you stir it around nice and good until everything is incorporated. You're creating almost like a batter and you're allowing the breadcrumbs to soak up the liquid of the egg and expand a little bit because they're going to create the structure of our Brocco popper. Okay, so I think we've mixed that around. We have a very, very, what I would call thick batter, almost like, eh, like a cornbread, almost. Looks like nice, cheesy, delicious cornbread. To that, I'm gonna add the broccoli. Now, here's your dark green, all of you who have <laughs> difficulty serving dark greens, yay. Um, we are using frozen broccoli in this recipe. And if you have heard rumors that frozen is not as good as fresh, it has less nutrients, it has less vitamins and minerals, I'm gonna stop that right now. Um, that's actually not true. Um, frozen vegetables, canned vegetables even, they have 
you know, just as much nutrients, vitamins and minerals as fresh. In fact, often the frozen vegetables are frozen right after picking. And so they're frozen at the peak of, you know, their quality. And so don't be afraid to use frozen vegetables. I would also say that if there are rumors that cooking ve vegetables makes them lose nutrients, that's wrong too. Um, I think the most important thing that we want for our participants is just for them to eat vegetables, no matter how they eat them, whether they be from frozen or canned or steamed or fresh or cooked, um, the vegetables, nutrients, vitamins, and minerals will all be there. Okay, so I'm gonna add this broccoli. And I took the frozen broccoli, thawed it out, and I chopped it into smaller pieces. Um, it came in those broccoli florets, and I really wanted it to be smaller so that it would incorporate and we would have um, broccoli as well as the batter in each bite. And so I would say a small dice, um, you know, but don't you know, don't get too technical about it. Just run the knife through it several times. Make sure that you're chopping it down and you don't have any large chunks. We're gonna mix it around quite a bit. And if I were just doing this myself, I would probably stick my hands in it and get them nice and dirty to get it all mixed up. But I know, I'm gonna try to be nice and clean here. So I wanna make sure that as I'm mixing it, that I'm getting the batter at least incorporated with most of the broccoli. And you're gonna see why here in a second. While I continue to mix that, hey, Jenny, let's launch one more poll so I can get this incorporated. Great, thank you, Jessica. Mm -hmm. So I think I'm gonna get kind of spicy here with y'all. <laughs> Cause I know Jessica is gonna talk about spices and herbs. So a fun trivia poll, according to the Guinness World Records, the hottest chili pepper in the world is the ghost pepper, the red Savina habanero, the scotch bonnet pepper, the Bahamian ghost pepper, or the Carolina reaper. And so I'm going to give you about another 10 seconds. Ooh, they all sound super hot to me. That's all I can say. Okay, let's see. Top of the charts is the ghost pepper. The ghost pepper. But the correct answer is actually the Carolina Reaper. The Reaper. I guess when they say don't fear the reaper, they're not talking about the chili pepper. You better fear that one, huh? Don't fear the Carolina reaper. <laughs> exactly. Okay, so I've got my batter and I'm gonna move it over here to the camera so you can just sort of see it's incorporated pretty good now. It's sort of, um, I would say like a sticky, not sticky, but, um, yeah, a little bit sticky consistency because what we want to do is when we make our broccoli poppers, we want them to stay together on the pan until we bake them. So we wanted to make sure that we stirred that nice and good. I'm going to take a number 30 scoop, which is about two tablespoons. And I have a sheet pan ready to go. Got some parchment on there, it's sprayed lightly with cooking spray. I'm gonna take my number 30 and I'm going to press it against the side of the bowl so that I pack the mixture in there. I might even pack a little bit with the heel of my hand. And I'm gonna put this on the sheet pan. There we go. And we've got a nice little popper. So cute. Now, like I say, I kind of feel like, you know, potentially there may be some grab and go in our future. There may be some, some meals in classrooms or child care centers. And these poppers are good for little hands, they're good to, to take um, and not too messy. So I think they'll be kind of fun. If you have some 
extra frozen broccoli and time on your hands. And you don't wanna serve these right away, but you wanna go ahead and prep them. You can make these to this point. Um, you'll portion them out on your sheet pan, just like I'm doing now. And then before cooking them, just throw them in the freezer. You're gonna freeze those until they're nice and rock hard. You can take them off the tray, put them into an airtight container or even a bag, um, and then put them back in the freezer and save them until you're, you're ready to bake them. Once you're ready, then you'll pull them out, put them back on sheet tray with parchment and bake them off. So it's nice to have these in the freezer if you need them or if you're doing grab and go and sending meals home, maybe you send them home frozen at this state um, with some directions to families just on how to, how to bake them off. Um, and then that quality stays nice and tasty and they can do a little fun recipe at home. It's really not very difficult. So I'm just gonna continue to do this. I'm gonna fill this sheet pan and then I'm gonna set it aside. I did test out uh, freezing these and then uh, baking them. And when you do bake them from frozen, you don't have to thaw them. You just pull them straight out, you bake them. And um, it just takes maybe three to five extra minutes in the oven. And they are just like you just made them. So I'm gonna put the rest of the mixture to the side. Wipe off my hands. If you don't get a lot of messy, not any fun. Get a lot of messy, get a little messy, or a lot of messy, not really sure. So, All right. Uh, awesome, yeah. this look awesome. And I know <laughs> that we had included in the packet some recipes for dips and dressings. Um, so check those recipes out. Those Absolutely. are wonderful accompaniments. Absolutely. We're going to talk a little bit about that too. So I'm going to put these in the oven. We've preheated our oven to 375. They're going to go in for about 15 to 20 minutes. And you just want to put them in there until the bottoms of those poppers are nice and golden brown. And you start to see that cheese is melty and delicious. And Jenny's right. There are so many things that you can do with these. This is the basic recipe, but you can rearrange it, switch it up. We've also included another kind of portable grab and go recipe that we really like. And that is cauliflower tots from our friends at Food Hero. The cauliflower tots we've made in many different culinary trainings and they've been a big hit. Um, if you have not heard of Food Hero before, Food Hero is part of the extension office of OSU and they develop recipes that are easy to do, um, take few ingredients and are budget friendly. And they've worked with ODE in the past to take some of those recipes and quantify them so that they could be used in schools or child cares or larger organizations. And then ODE credited them. So they're out there, they're credited, they're ready to go. You can rearrange them and we're gonna talk about how, but remember, if you aren't changing the main components too much, you're not changing the crediting. So that's always good to remember because we don't want you to be scared to have a little fun with your recipes. So those cauliflower tots are just as fantastic as these Brocco poppers. And the fact that I can say that all in one sentence, we'll see if I can say it 10 times fast, my goodness. So while those are cooking, I'm gonna briefly talk about some ways that you might change things up. Um, so herbs and spices are a great way to add some variety to your vegetable recipes. We included a fantastic handout about vegetable herbs and spices. And really what this handout is um, all about is which herbs and spices pair best with certain vegetables. So we've done our broccoli, we've got our great Brocco popper, but let's say two months down the road, we wanna add a little something new. Well, they're telling us that dill, mint, or oregano will go with broccoli really well. So, okay, maybe we decide we're gonna add some oregano to the batter 
and see how kids like that or how the participants react. So don't be afraid to give herbs and spices a try. I will say one uh, hint of advice. If you decide to do it, start small. Start with one herb, just a little bit, or one spice. Test it out, taste it, get some feedback, and then grow from there. And I think you'll really have some amazing dishes. Now, one other thing that y'all talked about in your surveys for vegetables is you like to serve sometimes a dipping sauce with vegetables. It encourages kids. We know that kids love ranch, at least when I was working in the schools, that was the favorite condiment. Um, so we have our ranch dipping sauce recipe in the packet. We've done that at culinary training quite a bit as well. It's a huge favorite. And I've actually made the recipe to show you how you can rearrange this one to kick things up a little bit, maybe change things and, entice your participants to go for those veggies, maybe with that side of dipping sauce. So we have our traditional ranch recipe, like I said, always a great recipe, always a fan favorite. Got that there. But let's say you wanna add a little bit of uh, spice to it and you put in some chili powder or maybe taco seasoning like I've done here. Serve that if you're doing um, maybe a taco day and you've got some great roasted vegetables, you want to serve that alongside, that's a great idea. Or perhaps you've been in a junior high or high school that has this lovely bottle of sweet chili sauce. This is something I saw quite a bit of. Every time I thought it was either halfway full or completely empty. What if you add a little bit of that sweet chili sauce to your ranch and hit a little bit of that heat note? You kick up the heat a little bit. I bet kids would really like that. One last thing I'll say is that our friend Krista went to um, a training about flavors and apparently the new thing at the high school is something called gojujang. And hopefully I said that right. <laughs> but it is actually a Korean hot chili paste. So head out and buy some of that, add that to your ranch, see how they like it. All right, so lots of ideas and we have a lot more. I am going to introduce one of our um, food service directors from Newburgh School District, Shiloh Fisek, who is going to share some amazing recipes with us Hey, Shiloh. Um, he's going to show us what he does in his kitchen, um, and we've included some of those recipes in your packet. So, Shiloh, take it away. Thank you, Jessica. Um, hello, everybody. Um, I'm here at one of our elementary schools in Newburgh, and we're gonna I'm going to show you three things today. One that is not in the packet, but we're going to kind of start off the two recipes I included with something that I can accompany any kind of Asian dish. And I think Jessica really hit a good point that vegetables are sometimes not necessarily an afterthought, but I want people to think about there's so many different ways to cook vegetables. I mean, we all have steamers, you can roast, you could blanch. Or how about even thinking about with a hot entree to add something maybe not hot. Let's do a room temp salad or a cold salad. And we're gonna demo uh, just some marinated cucumbers. You guys are just gonna to have to imagine that it's gonna be accompanied by some orange chicken or teriyaki chicken. And I'm gonna hand this off to my camera person. Okay, so what we're gonna do is some marinated cucumbers. And what cucumbers, you can keep the peel on it adds some great texture. I usually end up peeling just parts of it down the cucumber just to add some of the different colors. Now, one thing to think about is when you get cucumbers, all of us use different distributors. Some, I didn't include in the recipe to de-seed them. It really depends on the cucumbers you get. You could get pickled cucumbers. You could get English cucumbers. The cucumbers that I got, I noticed that are really seedy um, today. So I decided to just take the seeds out and scoop. And you can just scoop them out, it's really quick. 
or you can keep the seeds in. That's going to be up to you. And then we're going to just cut these up here real quick. And then we're going to throw a little marinade on them and let them marinate for about an hour. Um, I don't know if a lot of you like sushi, but this is kind of a recipe that you see in the base of a seaweed salad. So it's just basically rice wine vinegar and soy sauce. Soy sauce adds a little bit of that saltiness to it and then the sweetness from the rice wine vinegar. So once we get all this chopped up, you can throw it in a container and then we're going to dress it with a little bit of our soy sauce and rice wine vinegar. And I've already kind of pre-made it. Go ahead and make a huge batch. It's not going to go bad. And uh, it's something that could be, you know, you can make it batched or sugared out to your kitchens or just for some uh, future use. So we're just going to add a little bit to coat our cucumbers. And we're going to stir it up a little bit. And really the magic happens after it has been marinating for an hour. And I'm going to show you because I kind of got a before and after. So right here, you can kind of see, doesn't look like much. But when we look here, here's some cucumbers that have been marinating for an hour. Now they start to kind of, they get a little bit softer and it gets to almost the kind of like a, a pickly note to it. So if you just imagine, here's a basic school tray, right? That we haven't seen in a long time due to COVID. Um, your main dish will go here and then you have all your side components. And then if you just get a half cup portioning size and add your salad. And then here I have some toasted sesame seeds. You do not have to toast them. You can buy them pre-toasted. Um, I think it adds uh, a little bit of nuttiness to it, but then you can just add a little bit of sesame seeds and that's really simple. Now, the next dish I am gonna talk about is a, we have some carrots and some broccoli here. And I did get these fresh, but you are, you can use the brown box uh, vegetables that you can get from USDA. Um, they said they're, there's equally as good, but you're just gonna have to prep them a different way. So the cooking time, it, it's gonna be a little bit different. Um, what we did in the recipe, so I just have, these are big carrots. We all seen these, you can prepackage, you get the five pound bags. So I just cut them in half. And what we're gonna do is put them in a bowl. We're gonna add a little bit of oil. And a little bit of garlic. Now garlic is another thing that you can, uh, you don't have to get uh, heads of garlic and peel them yourself. You can get chopped garlic, you can get whole garlic and, and chop yourself. There's tons of different varieties. So we're just gonna kind of stir this in and then we're gonna lay it down on a sheet pan and we're gonna roast it. So what roasting does is we're gonna take some of those natural sugars in your vegetable and we're gonna caramelize it. That's gonna cause it to become pretty sweet. One thing to think about is whenever you're cooking vegetables, if you're gonna stack a huge mound on a sheet pan, you're not gonna get that caramelization. You're gonna get kind of like a steaming. So you're gonna to wanna to make sure there's adequate space. And I think a prime example is you wouldn't want it to be stacked up like that. You're gonna to wanna to evenly spread it out on a sheet pan. Make sure it's all well coated. And you're gonna throw it in probably, this dish takes 25 minutes to cook and I already have a finished product, but you're gonna cook it for 10 to 12 minutes right around there and at 425 and uh, get some caramelization. And then we're gonna add the broccoli. Now, one thing, I already have an oven that's already, and this is kind of, once you get the caramelization, you'll add your broccoli, you'll toss it in olive oil, and you'll kind of end up with this finished piece. Now, everybody could probably take a look at this or some carrots that have some color and be like, oh my God, this is burnt. Uh, not necessarily. This, the, the caramelization that you're seeing here is actually going to be very sweet. So what we're going to do is once your vegetables are hot and they come out, we have a bowl here that we're going to toss them into. I highly recommend using uh, parchment paper, by the way, just so anybody that's washing dishes doesn't kill you. 
Um, this is a soy sauce mixture and a little bit of brown sugar. And we're just gonna mix it up a little bit. And again, you can make this, you can make a little batch, keep it for future use. And we're just gonna coat the vegetables a little bit just for a little bit of flavor. Again, that soy sauce is gonna add that little bit of salt because I know that in our kitchens, we're not throwing handfuls of salt into everything. So you try to find products that have salty components to it, like soy sauce or maybe Parmesan cheese. This, the Parmesan cheese is not in this, but it's just an example how you can bring a salt level up. So right here, we have a little bit of that soy sauce and brown sugar, and we're gonna to toss it. Here's a little bit of chili flake just for the heat. That just really depends on how spicy you want it. So if you wanna do this for middle school, high school, gauge your um, students on, on what they're liking. So then we're gonna imagine here, again, here's a tray. We're gonna have some Asian, um, an Asian dish, whether it's orange chicken and rice. And then this is a vegetable component. And don't think that you're just limited. You know, I think as Jessica mentioned, you don't have to be limited to, what if you wanted to sub a different vegetable out and kind of use the same concept you could, you're gonna to have to um, just acknowledge what vegetable subgroup you're doing. Um, you know, if you want to put water chestnuts, baby corn, something in this dish, you can. Um, again, toasted sesame seeds. And we'll just put some toasted sesame seeds on top. And that's it. Okay, I am gonna move this aside. So one other thing with vegetables and talking about utilization, um, we were talking, uh, I was talking with Jessica about a baked potato bar. It is a great way to utilize anything that you've done throughout the whole week. Um, say that you have diced ham that you are putting in chef salads, or you have maybe your USDA um, chicken filet that you had the, the previous day. And what we like to do is do a baked potato bar and whatever you have, it's, sounds, <laughs> it's funny, it's like kitchen, uh, kitchen cleanup and utilization. So what I did was I already got a pre-baked potato, but if you just have a regular russet, go ahead and wash it. You know, you always, everybody always uses a fork to poke just to kind of create some of that steam. And what I do is we have, um, foil paper that you can get from Cisco and we're, we're going to individually wrap them. But what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take a step out because some of you are probably like, do you expect us to do a baked potato bar? How are we going to cut a potato and serve students at the same time? So I'm kind of taking some of the prep out or I'm just going to cut it halfway. What we're going to do is we're just going to fold it up, and bake it at 425. You can get a whole sheet pan of them and let them go. One thing we were talking about utilizing, think about maybe some of your uh, Mexican food days where you have fajita chicken. By the way, fajita chicken is probably my favorite brown box item that we get. Uh, kids love it. But it's a great way to utilize if any of that stuff's left over. So here's the baked potato part that I've cut in half. And notice that if your staff were just to unravel it real quick, split that apart. And we have that. And then you could have, um, say, some of your roasted veggies that you could add to it. And then I have some fajita chicken that we're going to add. And a little bit of cheese. And if this was piping hot, it would be definitely melting. Uh, but this is just one quick way how you can utilize some products and incorporate some vegetables in, um, and utilize some of your USDA food. So with that, I also want to kind of talk about steaming. Uh, all of us have different equipment. And let's take a step back, actually. With ovens, so I'm cooking something at 425 in your kitchen. It's going to be different. You're going to still click it to 425. And we're going to be cooking at what we think is the same temperature, but each piece of the equipment is different. It might take you three minutes longer than what my recipe says, or it might cook it a little bit faster because our temperatures on our ovens are going to be a little bit off. Um, so make sure that you're 
you're playing with these recipes and you're kind of gauging it, give your, allow yourself some time to service. And then when you think about steaming vegetables, I know a lot of concern or hard points is when you're steaming vegetables and you're putting them on a line. After a while, they start to turn to mush, right? How do you how do you maintain that quality? And it would be smaller batches, or maybe that you're cooking things too packed together, so the top and the bottom layer are just mush, and the, the middle layer is perfect. So you really have to play with timing, and get yourself a watch and start a product in the oven, and, and get to know your equipment really well. I think that is the best thing that you can do is get to know your equipment. When you start a dish, start that timer, and then when it's perfectly done, look at it, say it takes 15 minutes, and look at your lunch schedule. Say lunch is at 11.30, and you know that steamed vegetables take 15 minutes, so maybe you're starting it at 11.12. It's perfectly cooked. You have three minutes to kind of put it on the line and ready to serve. Maybe do a few more batches if your lunch goes out. So I hope some of this stuff has helped. I um, appreciate Woody having me here, and if you guys have questions, I'm going to have them kind of share contacts. I have tons of ideas that I would love to share. I'd love to see, you know, if anybody has questions, ideas. Um, I think this year has really taught us that we need to rely on each other and there's, we can all help each other. So thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Silo. It's so amazing. It looks delicious. I'm thinking about dinner. I'm thinking I've got some good ideas. See if I've got a baked potato make myself a baked potato bar. Um, that was such good information. And I like when Shiloh talks about batch cooking, you know, um, if you have several lunch services and are able to cook smaller portions and then cook in between each service, it really helps with the quality um, of the vegetables. And I know that might not be an option for everybody, but as he said, playing with what you have, learning your equipment, and just trying things out is a great way to learn what works for you and your organization and, and what maybe doesn't. So I know there were a couple questions about the Brocco poppers, so I want to get to those um, just quickly. So the recipe uses frozen eggs or frozen egg product. You can use fresh eggs or just whole eggs. So a whole egg, a large egg is typically about two ounces. So you would determine how much you need based on how many ounces um, are required in the recipe. So for instance, for 12 servings, we're looking at 14 ounces of frozen egg products. So that's about seven eggs. Um, so play with that a little bit. For our um, child care and our uh, head starts, those with the littles, the little mouths, the little hands. The Bracco Poppers recipe credits for a half a cup of the vegetable. And so um, knowing your meal pattern, um, our littles, our one to twos, our three to fours, maybe don't need that much. So you can determine how many poppers um, you want to give them. Uh, five poppers is a half a cup. So you might only need two or three, depending on uh, how old the kids are and what the serving size. Um, before we go into our last sponsor's um, presentation, I wanted to see, Jenny, do you have another poll that you want to launch? Of course I have another poll. And it, thank you, Shiloh, for that baked potato bar demonstration. Um, in keeping with that, um, potatoes are the most consumed vegetable in the U.S. The average American eats how many pounds per year? Is it 73, 24, 49, or 18? And I'm gonna give you all another couple of seconds to answer that. Mm. Mm. I feel like it's gotta be a lot. Okay, and so 59% of you believe it is 49 pounds per year, and that is the correct answer. Ooh. Fantastic. Good job. We like our potatoes. I do, at least. <laughs> so the next sponsor that provided us some information about what they're doing with vegetables is actually a Head Start, Head Start of Lane County. Um, and 
gotta love them. They said they were a little bit shy, so they didn't want to go on screen, and I can totally understand that, but they did send us some pictures of the items that they're making that they say their participants are really enjoying. Before I do that, my timer's done, so I'm just going to check those Brocco poppers and maybe pull them out, and then we'll talk a little bit about, oh yeah, we'll talk a little bit about what Head Start of Lane County is doing. Now they're using um, one of our Food Hero recipes. It is in your handbook. It is roasted asparagus, but they've taken it upon themselves to rearrange it a little bit um, and make it a little bit different. So I am going to, let's see, Krista, I'm gonna share my screen so I can show you this presentation. All right, so I'll start the slideshow. Here we go. All right, so again, head start of Lane County, they're doing roasted asparagus. I want to give a shout out to this crafty crew. And we've got Gregorio, Julie, Brenda, and not pictured here, we have Rhonda and Sarah. So they are the geniuses behind our recipe. Now I know I've heard from some sponsors, particularly when I go into child cares or Head Starts, that um, tell me that they don't want to really branch out into a lot of weird, we'll say, or different vegetables because young kids don't like that or young kids are picky eaters. Well, I am going to challenge you to say that young kids are really adventurous and they are willing to try things. It may just be that we need to rearrange the recipe. So here's what Head Start of Lane County has done. They took a fantastic roasted asparagus recipe from Food Hero. And as Shiloh mentioned, roasting our vegetables brings out the natural sugars in the vegetable. It condenses the flavor of the vegetable and it really makes um, it just more palatable. It makes it sing for a lot of people. Um, so they're using that. Make sure you find your recipe as we've talked about. Of course, you wanna make sure you've got quality ingredients. It all starts with the ingredients we have. So they've got a great bundle of, couple bundles of fresh asparagus. Um, if you are getting um, food from a distributor, if you're using USDA food, commodities, um, if you're going to the grocery store, don't be afraid to branch out and find something new. If it comes in and it doesn't look good, send it back or try something different. This is all experimenting. This is trying new things. So of course we wanna wash those things, make sure they're nice and clean and cut off the tips. And then they're rearranging it by spicing it up a little bit. We've talked about herbs and spices and they've taken it upon themselves to add a little bit of lemon pepper, a little bit of garlic and um, spice up that seasoning flavor profile. So they put that on the sheet tray as Shiloh talked about layer it out, top it with the olive oil, and then sprinkle it with the spice mixture. When you do that, that olive oil kind of acts as the glue for those spices. And so you really wanna make sure that once you drizzle the olive oil and sprinkle the spices, that you sort of mix it up a bunch. Um, go ahead and do it with your hands or with some tongs, just so that you get spices on all of those asparagus. This is layering flavor. Then they're gonna roast them. Um, and roasting is anywhere, you know, with a temperature of 400 for convection, maybe 425, 450, anything above 400 is usually considered roasting. So they put that in the middle of the oven and they roast it off. They wanna make sure that everything is cooking evenly. So you wanna make sure that you pull it out, check it if you need to stir it. Um, do that, and then it's done. And you can see this delicious picture here of their roasted asparagus. Put that on a plate, and serve it out to your kiddos or your participants. I was really excited to hear them when they answered the survey, talk about how the kids are really excited and accepting of, of something that might be a little bit different 
something that maybe they haven't tried, maybe they haven't tried it at home, but they're willing to try it at the Head Start and they're really enjoying it. So huge shout out to um, Head Start of Lane County. They did an amazing job with that. And I think it really just goes to show that you can give anything a try um, and you never know what you're gonna land on and, and what's gonna work. So um, I think it's fantastic. So shout out to Brenda and the crew um, with Head Start of Lane County. So hopefully that's inspiring to some of you other child care centers or Head Start. Um, I've actually been in many um, centers and I act, I'm pretty impressed by the, the different things that y'all try and, and different things that you provide to kids. So congrats on that. So we have talked about a ton today and I know it's a lot of information. Hopefully we've given you some ideas on how to vary vegetables, how to make those sub zeros into superheroes. Um, a little more information about what's in your packet since we have a few minutes left in the session. We've included um, information, as I mentioned at the beginning, about storing vegetables and the best way to store them, whether it be in the cooler, whether it be outside of the cooler, and then which vegetables to store together, because some vegetables produce ethylene gas um, that ripen other vegetables or maybe make them ripen too quickly. So that's a great handout. I learned a lot from that. We also have included some great information about why meals are important in schools and child cares, um, the importance of the WISC model, whole school, whole community, whole child. I get it wrong every time, but I, I knew I was gonna get it right this time. So I'm gonna show you our finished product, the Brocco Poppers. Thanks, Chris, for reminding me. I'm smelling them and not even paying attention. Our Brocco Poppers, here we go. I don't know if Krista can see that on the other. So there's the bottom, nice and brown. We have our little Brocco Popper. The cheese is melty. This is the perfect little bite. Um, great for dipping. Great for, I don't know, just eating. <laughs> I can tell you I've been um, practicing this recipe. I've done it several times, so I've had many Brocco poppers and I'm a huge fan now. I didn't think I would be, but I really enjoy them. So it's hopefully something that you're interested in giving a try. Um, if, it, if the Brocco poppers don't work for you, rearrange it, make something else, use a different vegetable, use some more different spices or herbs. Um, something to elevate and inspire, um, something to entice all those participants that we have. All right, so we have some information in the chat about the WISC model. Thank you so much. We are gonna be sending out some follow-up information after the session in the coming week. We'll send you an email with all of the links for information we've talked about. And we'll also send you a post survey or a post um, I guess we're calling it a post-test um, for that CDC grant. So please take a moment to finish that. Um, but also we're gonna send you an evaluation. Now remember how much I talked about how helpful the evaluation from the last culinary training was. We're gonna send another one and we really wanna hear your thoughts, suggestions and ideas. Um, if you have ideas for the next culinary training, we would love to hear them. I hope you've enjoyed sort of hearing from other sponsors and what they're doing and connecting in the chat. I am gonna pass it over to Jenny for one more poll or trivia question as we get wrapped up. And then we're gonna open it up for any other questions, chat, or just conversation. Great, thank you, Jessica. Those bro Brocco poppers look delicious. And so my last fun poll is, Oregon ranks in the top five producers in the nation for all of the following except onions, snap beans, sweet corn, potatoes, or green peas. 
which one is it? One of those five, mm, not in fine. The top five producers in the nation for Oregon. Oh, okay. So most people think it's green peas. It is in fact, sweet corn. Oregon ranks number four in the nation for production of green peas. Amazing. I wouldn't have guessed that. I would have guessed green peas as well. Fascinating information. Another fun fact is that Oregon ranks number one in the world for production of hazelnuts. Now that I can imagine. I've seen those trees as I've been driving through the countryside. Awesome. Thanks, Jenny. All right, so that wraps up our presentation session for this culinary training. We are so excited, as I mentioned, that you were able to join us. Hope you learned a few things about vegetables. We're gonna leave this open, but we're gonna stop recording and we're just going to open it up for any questions. Um, if you wanna put them in the chat, if you wanna raise your hand feature and we can unmute you so you can ask a question. If you just wanna chat or say something, feel free to let us know. We're gonna hang out here with you guys um, and have a little bit of connection.